So then comes toolpaths. There's a lot to do to make toolpaths for three-axis machining. Um, uh, so just just repeating some names. Uh, Kerf is is what's left when the tool goes behind. Offsetting is picking a toolpath that displaces for the size of the tool, and then uh, if you have a tool the actual kerf will be a bit bigger than the tool diameter because of run out, which has to do with how much the machine wobbles and how much it's misaligned and all of the imperfections. So to mill, you need to anticipate for the kerf offset and run out. Then there's conventional versus climb. So if you have a tool um, that's turning, um, and you have a shape that you're making, you can either go in this direction or in this direction. So um, if you, um, uh, so in, in the relative direction, if to compare those, if, um, just to make the pictures look the same, So if the tool is cutting into the direction you're going, um, what's good about that is it's digging into the stock, and so the cutting helps keeps it aligned. What's bad is you're digging in on the skinny part where it's hard to start, and then you're finishing on the thick part, and so you're leaving behind where the cut started, and so that has a rougher finish. If you do it in the opposite direction, where you're cutting in from above, it puts much more force on the machine because the tool is trying to climb on top. But you're biting in on the thick part and you're leaving behind the thin part. So climb machining leaves back a smoother cut, but it puts much more force on the machine. So you might do conventional for rough cutting and then uh, climb for finish cutting. Then there's um, the tool path. And so um, a, it, it, if you just cut in two dimensions, that's a 2D path. A two and a half D path is where you move horizontally, but you make vertical steps between the paths. A three axis path is where you move in all three axes at once. And you typically don't do that for rough cutting, but for finish cutting, you do full three-axis paths to continuously follow the surface. Um, if you have a five-axis mill, three plus two is doing three-axis cutting from more than one direction. And then finally, there's full five-axis where you use all degrees of freedom at once. And so typical on a three-axis mill is you'll do two and a half D cutting to rough cut, and then you'll do full three axis cuts for finish cutting. Um, and so uh, this is an example on the left is rough cutting where I'm just making steps to quickly remove. And the, medella, the mill's happy because I'm cutting horizontally, but then I go back and I, 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 I profile, and this is low versus high resolution, following the shape to do these finish cuts. And the finished cuts can then leave behind a beautiful surface. So, um, th this is an example of rough and finished cutting. And then when you're behind, you can you know, really get these beautiful surfaces. This is for molding and casting. And um, this is a neat example. This was done by Carl Scheffler in the Norway Fab Lab, where he just started with a solid block of wood and then made this. Um, by clever fixturing, that this was done by machining on multiple sides. And so this was just done with a three-axis milling machine, but making this much more complex shape by just uh, being clever in fixturing and doing multiple paths. Now, a common beginner mistake is if you look at an end mill, there are the flutes. Then there's a shank. Then there's a tool holder. So you can only cut with that much of a tool 
and then you need to fit in the shank and the tool holder. So there's a depth of cut, and typically the depth of cut is less than what you think. So when you make the tool pass, you need to anticipate the cut depth of your tool. A common beginner mistake is to have a deep, skinny section, and you don't do clearance checking, and when you start machining, you plow the shank of your tool into the stock. So you need to make clear, there's clearance for the shank of your tool so you don't collide with the stock. And how you do that depends on the tool you're using, but you need to anticipate that. Um, another um, thing you'll see often is a, a T-bone slot. So if I make a slot in one piece of stock, and then let's say I have a tab that's going to fit in here, what you find is it doesn't work. And the reason is, because of the radius of curvature of the tool, like that, you get a curve shape here, and if you try to fit in your tab, you get a collision here. So the way you handle that is you make a shape that looks like this. You put ears, and so if you look at the offsetting, it means the tool can come here and here. So you make little ears that have room so that your tool can make a uh, square corner all the way in. So you, uh, you'll see the T-bone. Um, leading in and leading out is the notion that when the tool goes down, you get features that look different when you go horizontally. So for wood or jet cutting, for example, you punch through away from the edge of the cut. And even for machining, um, depending on the surface finish, you want to think about where the tool goes down versus where it goes horizontally, where you get those features. Then two really important things to do this week. One is test cuts. Don't spend hours milling a big thing and find you got it wrong. You want to warm up by making little cuts just to make sure speeds and feeds are right and you're in control of the process. So don't do the project first. Just make a little tiny part to make sure tooling, speeds, feeds are happy, then do the big job. I've seen many projects you know, stock ruined by running a whole job and, and uh, the uh, speed feeds or offsetting, things like that are wrong. And then a second thing is cutting air, especially when you're learning. The first thing you should do is prepare your tool path, get everything ready, but run the job in the air. Run it above your stock and make sure in the air it looks happy, then go down and, and cut your stock. Often, as, as a beginner, the first move, you'll, you'll find, for example, you zeroed it wrong. And so the cutting doesn't happen where you expect it to. So cut air first to make sure it's happy, then go ahead and um, cut stock. So many options for the tool path. Um, uh, Roland software, the Medela comes with software for tool path generation. Uh, Shopbot comes with nice software for tool path generation for it. Um, Feature Cam is one of the commercial packages we use in the shop at MIT for more complex tool path generation. Uh, Wooderjet, OMAX has nice software. And then um, Fab Modules can do all the things I'm describing. So I'll go through that now. So, um, yeah. Sure. yep. Do you have any experience with uh, Autodesk CAM 360? Um, not, no, because I think that came from Autodesk bought HSM Works, and I think that's what was digested from that. And so I haven't used that. Um, just try it and tell us next week. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, let's see. So, let me make sure. Oh, I, I, I sorry. I, oh, I, um, this won't work. I'm not running. I'm not running the virtual desktop with the uh, GL extensions, but I can do it this way. So, in the fab modules, I'm going to go from an STL, for example, to a shopbot, and I'm going to start 
let me start with an STL file. So um, here's a um, STL file of just a sample pocket to mill. Um, there's some defaults built in. Um, so what I just did is I turned the STL into a height map. So now white is high and dark is low. Then, just using the default, I just made a toolpath, and here I'm rough cutting. Then I'm going to make the shopbot file, and then here's the shopbot file ready to go to the shopbot. So that was rough cutting. Um, if I pick finish cutting, now you can see the rough cutting is horizontal planes. The finish cutting is doing full three-axis moves following it. And so if we go, go back through the, the, the settings, um, uh, this is the tool diameter. Um, this is the overlap. Um, here I'm setting the cut depth. And so if I make that um, uh, bigger, it'll take uh, fewer cuts. And then um, here is how many offsets to do. And right now I'm removing all the material. And then if I want to finish cut, this is setting how much I overlap. So if I make that a, a, a very little overlap, it's coarser. If I make that, now I'm making very fine passes, and it gives me a very smooth continuous surface uh, is, is the setting for that. And then now for the shop bot, I have to specify how fast to move cutting, how fast to move jogging, how fast to spin the spindle, how high it goes, climb versus conventional and unit. And so those are all the things to do it for the shop bot. Um, if I want to make it on it with G codes, if you have a G code machine, um, everything looks the same here. It, the only difference for G codes is you have to specify if you have it coolant flow and you have to specify a tool number. But here's the G codes to go to the G code machine. Then. One of the things you can do is um, you can start right from a PNG and make the toolpath. Um, and so one way you can do this week's assignment is um, using a paint program to make a height map for what you want to machine. And then we can go ahead and mill that. And then you can also. Um, if I have so if I read in an SCG um, here now I've made that as a shopbot file and what this is doing now is instead of a height map and offsetting and all of that this is just simply taking the SCG as a vector path to follow. So if you want to tell it not the shape to make, but the path for the tool, you can write an SVG, and then the fab modules will read that and write it out. Uh, so the fab modules, those options, are a much smaller subset than what, for example, ShopBot software does. But those are the options you use most of the time. So I do almost always I use this to make the tool path. There's more advanced things where you need finer grain control where uh, in something like um, FeatureCam or ShopBot software. But this covers most of what you need for toolpath generation. And so that's what I use most of the time. Now, under the hood, what's happening is the fab modules read your design. The offsetting step makes a pass file. And this is just an integer lattice where it's defining segments in the lattice. Um, for the Modella, it's then turned into an RML file, which is a variant of HP's plotter language, HPGL. For the ShopBot, it's turned into a ShopBot file, which is a simple format ShopBot defined. For G-code machines, it's the venerable G-code format it turns it into. Um, and then for water jet cutting, it's the org file. So within the fab module are a bunch of little routines that do each of those. So if we go to – so 
so th this is the routine in the fab modules that reads in the path, and then this is a little bit of code with the shot bot format. And so uh, these are very easy to write for uh, particular machines. There's a lot of work that goes in the computational geometry for the path planning. I'll talk about that later in the semester. Okay, so that's tool path generation. Much more goes into tool pathing this week than we've done so far. Uh, safety. Um, this is not linked to a horrible news story about a student who died at Yale while machining. Um, she got caught in the machine and it killed her. Uh, there have been a number of accidents like this. This is a recent one that prompted uh, a, a, a lot of soul searching and review of machine shops. Um, I made light of the fire department with the foam. This is very serious. Uh, the machines we're using this week can hurt you, and you can hurt them. Uh, safety is a much bigger issue for large format machining. Uh, in the MIT version, we have all of our students do a training course with our environmental health and safety going over all of the safety issues, and they have to be checked out to do it. So there are a number of things that can happen. Um, one is cuts. Um, when you're machining, what you leave behind are sharp bits. Um, a horrible kind of accident is if you're machining metal, you have these shiny things coming off that look very pretty that are actually razor blades. And they're still connected to the cutting stock. And a nasty accident that recurs is if you reach in to just you know, pat them or get them out of the way, it suddenly unwinds and slices your finger off. Um, so you need to be aware of forces driving sharp things. Um, you never, ever, ever reach into a powered tool. Um, if you need to do something with whatever is going on, you have to stop the tool. And these all stop easily. You never, ever reach into a powered tool. Um, when you're cutting, stuff gets hot. Um, when you're milling wood, if you're really pushing the feed rate, the wood chips get very hot. Uh, we had a fire in the shop at MIT in the dust collector, because somebody was cutting so fast, they had glowing embers of wood coming off, and they ignited the dust collector. Um, so things get hot. Um, there's large form of, um, forces. When you're milling, chunks can come loose and go flying. Uh, you need to think about ballistic propagation. Um, uh, so in turn, one implication is you, you can't use powered tools without safety glasses. Um, and that includes uh, drill presses as well as milling machines. When you're using powered tools driving force, chunks can go flying out. And there have been countless lost eyes from that. And so you have to wear uh, safety glasses when you're milling. Um, another thing is shoes. Uh, uh, this is simply moving large stock around. Um, uh, it's not hard for it to end up on your foot. You don't want to come in with a, a, your, uh, sandals. You want to protect your feet from what you're doing. Um, you don't want to have anything loose. It sounds obvious, but um, you don't want to have loose clothing, and you really don't want to have loose hair. The loose hair is what happened in that Yale accident. Um, hair gets tied up, no loose, floppy clothing. Nothing that can get caught in the machine. Sounds obvious. It sounds stupid. It's a recurring way people um, seriously hurt themselves. Um, whenever you start a powered tool, before you start it, you should stop and ask, do you know how to stop it? Sounds obvious. Any one of these machines sh should have an emergency stop. And before you start the job, you need to ask, how do I stop it? And make sure you're clear on, if anything goes wrong, what to do right away. You don't want to be kind of floundering around for what's the emergency stop procedure. So stop and ask, how do you stop it? And you never, ever 
do large format machining alone. There's enough ways things go wrong. This is something you always do with a buddy. You want to have somebody around if something goes wrong. Um, when I was in grad school, working late in the machine shop one night, uh, a fellow student yawned and he was doing a slitting process on the milling machine and he said, I'm so bored. And the next moment his finger came off. He wasn't paying attention and he put his finger in front of the slitting saw. And luckily we were there, we could collect him and his finger and run off to the hospital. But there's enough ways to hurt yourself that you always want to do this with somebody around. And you don't want to do this when you're distracted, when you're racing time. You, know, you want to be well fed, well rested, and really be able to pay attention. Um, laser cutters can make fires, large format machining. Um, done right is perfectly safe. Done wrong, there's many ways you can conspire to hurt yourself. You need to pay attention and be, uh, you know, have somebody else supervising you. You know, no matter how much you've done this, you always do this with somebody else around. Uh, Neil, yep. just as a little, uh, just as a little addition to this, I think it's interesting to know that if you cut anything like metal, even very thin aluminum, you should not uh, run your dust collector because the little pieces of aluminum can actually cause a fire in the motors. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, metal metal milling is not dust. Okay. So safety. Um, most of the shops don't have welding, but for joining metal, one of the processes we do is arc welding, MIG and TIG welding, um, spot welding um, locally, uh, friction welding where you um, move it so fast it joins, and ultrasonic welding where you dump energy in as, as ways to uh, join it, if you have that. So, each of you will get the equivalent of a four by eight foot sheet of plywood. And the assignment is make something big. If you look back in past years, you'll see lots of examples. So you know, custom furniture um, here. And we'll give you stock that we'll provide for everybody. You're welcome to overshoot that and get nicer stock if you want to do something bigger. So um, in the MIT fab class, um, for example, David this week did a really nice, he, he made a gift for his girlfriend, which was um, he bought nicer stock than the standard stuff we use. Um, and he made this uh, lovely, oh, I don't know if he has the final picture, he made this lovely press fit standing desk with a beautifully designed piece of furniture was his homework assignment. Um, let's see, another one was, uh, Um, Kirsten was inspired by the flexural examples I showed you, um, and uh, she made this lovely chair plus a side table. And she went beyond, again, the basic stock we're giving each of you and went, you know, bought more wood and spent more time machining, but this is what she did for the homework assignment for this week. Okay. Um, uh, many of your shops will have foam if you want to play with that. But focus this is, you each start with a sheet of plywood, make something big that's meaningful for you. Going through all the steps of, you can use any of the design workflows we've talked about, pick the stock, you have to settle how you're going to fix your, look at these options for toolpath, prepare a toolpath, um, and assemble and make something big. Questions or comments? Uh, I have a question for you, Neil, on some material. Um, I don't think anyone is aware of this, but I'm actually trying to finish the work for the Fab Academy last year for 2013, so any documentation from my side will be in the 2013 archive. But I'm actually trying to build skis. Um, so I'm working on building the press, and it's almost done with the shell, but I'm making the mold. and. Um, what my idea is to mill out all the different materials that got to make up my ski. And my question is specifically on the bottom layer, uh, so the one you slide on, which is sold everywhere as PTEX. 
Right. But the problem is that if I connect to local uh, sources of plastics, they all say that their HDPEs will not adhere to any kind of epoxy, which I'm going to use. And if I try to figure out what PTEX actually is, because it's a brand, it's not a type of material, I can't see here to, to figure out what exactly it is. Because PTEX is, again, it's a brand. So I'm trying to figure out what exactly, what type of material, what's the molecular structure, if you will, of the bottom layer of a ski. Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, I don't know what PTEX is. It's a high molecular weight plastic. I, I think it's in the spirit of HDPE, but even more H. It's, it's a higher molecular weight polymer. Um, yeah, so that that's what I'm that's what I keep hearing, and that's absolutely it. It's, it's a very high molecular weight polymer. But the problem uh, is, if I if I call local suppliers, they say that never sticks to epoxy. But that is still what I'm gonna glue it with. <laughs> boy, I'm I'm thinking how. Um, that's a neat problem. Well, um. One thought is, so I've never tried, so um, uh, let me, so a couple things. I'll, I'll, let me send a note to Jonathan, who spent a long time shopping plastics for the MTM machine. Um, what I'm wondering is if there's a way to do this without adhesive, if Given that we're doing full free access processes, um, if you can make something like a tongue and groove connection to make um, reversibly assembled skis, if, if, if you can make sort of tongue and grooves or clips or constraints so that it's not glued together, but it's mechanically assembled. I see what you mean, and that's an interesting question but uh, the the question still remains uh, what kind of material I want to use for the bottom layer because it needs to slide very well on snow obviously right um, and then a, so a, a variant of that would be if you can't um, make it you know a self-aligning structure you can also uh, these, these, these dense plastics mill beautifully, you know, thread beautifully. You might be able to like tap it and screw it together, something like that. Um, yeah, I, let me investigate. I've never tried to glue a high density plastic. Um, so, so if you if you look at the way skis are made by Rossignol or anyone doing that in their garage, it's PTEX. Yep. Fiberglass with epoxy, wood, another layer of fiberglass, and another layer of PTEX or ABS on the top. Yeah. Sorry. Well, one just... more thought would be um, uh, something that dissolves it through the equivalent of the acrylic cement. If you use um, like acetone or toluene with good ventilation, whether you can. Um, uh, you know, ha have a solvent for the plastic. Yeah, but the problem is with the solvent, it will adhere to another type of the same plastic, no? And and my plastics, both of them will go onto a wood core. Uh-huh, yeah. Got it. Let, um, let me ask one or two people. It's a good, it's an interesting question. I've never run, it, in retrospect, it's an obvious question. I've never run into it. I also okay. want to know the answer. Yep. Because uh, I, I want to make my uh, snowboard in some day. So uh, please send ah. me uh, me the email as well. Okay. Uh, what the process I'm going through? I don't know who you are, but the process I'm going through is exactly the same for making snowboard. So connect to me if you want, and I can show you all the stuff I've done so far. Yeah, he's yes, with. Please. Yeah, he's with. Um, uh, Frosty Investment Air. Ah, yes. Uh, I'm Takuma in uh, Best Manager. 
Yeah, and it, okay. a, a, a good next step for this class, let's see, if we go to Barcelona Fab Kids Skate Boards. Yeah, I'm, I'm also making skateboards right now. That's my yeah, step um, before the skis. <laughs> uh, Barcelona has been doing this nice project where um, you make tooling and then lay up skateboards. And um, this is a one thing that can be done in composite week. Um, this, this is where you take wood plies and you lay them up as a kind of a composite. And so a piece of this conversation we can pick up in composite week. Luciana is in charge of this program. Yes. Can I have your name? I, I, so that, that, that's mm -hmm. the Jean-Michel in Grenoble. Ah, yeah, thank you. Frosty will uh, tell me. Thank you. Okay. Okay. He'll, he'll sing my name to you. <laughs> okay, other questions or comments? Hey, Neil. Yes. Damien here, a uh, quick question. Uh, any, any pointers on painting or staining any of the materials that you talked about in relative to making furniture? Oh, uh, there's nothing unique about this, meaning the all of the woods I described take, take paint nicely. You know, the, the, the machining is unusual. The, the, the stains and the paints are completely normal. You just go, go to your like, local lumber yard or wood store. Um, there's, there's really nothing special. The, the only note is for the foams where you need to seal them before you can uh, paint them. Also, quickly, um, the the desk that you pointed to, can you can you tell me the name of that student? The which one? The the desk. The desk. Um, yeah, that one was here. I'll, I'll, I'll do that more slowly. If you, I'm going to go to fab.cba.mit.edu. And I'm going to click on the classes link. And the, the Fab Academy class we're doing now grew out of the MIT version of the class. So I'm going to go to 2013. I'm going to go to people. These are the students. And then that one was David Yamnitsky. And then he made this lovely desk. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about, about um, is isolation uh, foam. Uh, I use here in France uh, some uh, styrodure, uh, which is a styrene, uh, polystyrene uh, um, uh, expanded. No, not expanded. Uh, uh, extruded. Okay. And uh, I, I wonder uh, if it's possible to cut it with the laser. The yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's it. I have seen uh, somewhere that uh, we can cut uh, polystyrene in the laser, and somebody says me it's very dangerous because it can burn. But <laughs> I don't know if you try already. Yeah, I've never laser cut that. You, you would want to slow down the pulse rate to kind of spread out the energy. Um, uh, and you know, I don't think that, so, right, one one concern are um, you know, chlorinated, fluorinated compounds. I don't think there's any in here. Um, I've never tried it. I don't know. I, I mm -hmm. tr try a little test cut. Um, okay. Ge ge generally, we always do that on the milling machine just because it mills so fast. It, it mills as fast as the mill can move. And we're typically using much bigger pieces than fit in the laser cutter. Mm-hmm. But okay. I've never tried I've done, a, I've done a bit of it in our laser, um, and since I'm in France, it's probably the same material. Uh, it it melts more than it really gives you a clean cut, and it leaves you a very poor surface finish. So unless you have very thin material, I would really go milling and not laser cutting. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Final questions or comments? Okay. Uh, get started.
started early, uh, this week you'll be limited by time on the milling machine. So get your designs done quickly. You'll need the whole week to make it. But this is one of my favorite assignments. This has a lot of room uh, to express yourself in making big stuff. Good. Have fun and look forward to seeing what you all do in a week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.